had, uh, at least with the broad outline of what that company has been in. Um, so let me just get on with it. So what we, yesterday's lecture, we give a very big picture overview of India's overall growth performance. And where, as it's well known, that's where capital GDP is significantly in three decades following globalization compared to the earlier decades. And indeed, that was one of the main factors that capital did in this GDP uh, ranking and, and overall economic prosperity, uh, given, given its population size, there was this multiplier effect. But still, the contract income increase was not sufficient to raise India's global banking in this dimension, which is again something that a lot of uh, economists and policy writers are focused on. So today I'm going to really the lighting theme for today's talk would be some of the recent estimates from poverty in India actually show a sharp decrease. Okay. So that does pose a bit of a puzzle, especially in the light of a number of things I presented yesterday. So we saw that there was a significant increase in income and wealth inequality over the last three decades. And they were already starting from reasonably high levels. So uh, that has to be kept in mind. Moreover, we saw uh, in some of the income group specific growth rates we calculated uh, that the richest sections have increased their growth at a faster rate than the bottom 50% or the middle 40%. Therefore, whatever was the initial trends towards inequality, a uh, built in accelerator seems to get work. So this can only be, you know, uh, 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 get uh, uh, more accentuated going forward. And we also, for comparison, because you could well say that it's the nature of modern technology, globalization, and automation, so these things are happening everywhere. So we also uh, use China as a comparator. And of course, you know, one can question why China. One can, you know, subject to the data availability that the world equality database makes possible. One can make comparisons across other democratic countries too. But we found something very interesting. So that I highlighted yesterday that overall, of course, China growth was higher, as we all know. And interestingly, in the top groups, China's growth rates and India's growth rates were not that good. So the rich grew at a faster rate there also, as does India, if anything, for China, it was marginally more so. But where there is a clear distinction that emerges is for the middle uh, of the percent or the bottom 50 percent, China's growth was significantly higher uh, for those first one groups compared to India. So something clearly was happening in China in the middle and bottom, but it's in India's case. So we also presented uh, some suggestive evidence for the hypothesis that stagnant incomes for the vast majority of the population may be acting as a built-in depressor for the growth process through the demand and size, uh, you know, induced demand for uh, labor, these kind of chains. And indeed, we saw, also saw that there has been, in fact, a slowdown of growth over the last two decades that became visible well before the pandemic, starting around 2016. Despite this, you know, why is poverty showing a sharp increase? Now, there has been as you all know, and I will sort of remark uh, soon, that there is a data issue here, data availability issue, which is why there's a difference. Even the data availability market have been based, but that would be a more uh, you know, final debate where we would you know, contrast different methods and different estimation techniques. Whereas here, everybody's throwing darts in the dark. Now the question is, you know, uh, subject to this data limitation, what's the best we can do? So essentially, uh, some of these recent working papers uh, I find that they not from the IMF, but it's the World Bank. This suggests there's been a sharp reduction in extreme poverty. Now, these working papers that are often cited have the new disclaimer that these views do not necessarily represent the views of the institutions. But in the case of the World Bank, if you go and check their poverty database for all countries, they have now used the numbers that were presented for the India uh, uh, case that should be Hussein Arroy and Roy Van Der Weyde uh, uh, came up with. So therefore, at least in the case of the World Bank, which is indeed one of the leading uh, uh, databases on, on poverty, uh, that is an 
and become official. So roughly speaking, 22% was when we had the last uh, estimate from 21 to 2012, when the NSS expenditure surveys were released using the Tendulkar poverty line, which is similar to the World Bank extreme uh, poverty line of a dollar 90 cents per person per day. Now, essentially, what happened, uh, just to recap, that the government, uh, it was expected that it would come out with the NSS 2020 uh, report uh, in 2017-18. That never happened. Okay, for a number of reasons, and there was a fair bit of controversy around why the government did it. Of course, the official line that was never explicitly stated, but informally was that there were many problems with the sampling and, 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 and the actual surveys. But there are reasons to believe that if the results did not look so great, uh, you know, you know, or look differently, the results look better, they may have uh, you know, held their nose and, and released them anyway. So therefore, what these existing studies do, and I will also present some stuff that I have been working with uh, Vishal Kumar of UMass Boston, we are all using essentially synthetic methods because after 2011-12, we don't have a comparable data set for 2017-18, and of course, subsequently, you can, you can extrapolate from that. So essentially, you're using other data bases to uh, mass the distribution in 2011-12, and then have some projection as to what would have happened in 2017-18. So this is literally, again, throwing dots in the dark, but you know, it depends on how you do it, you can have more confidence in the estimates or so just to again recap, the volume bank and the Pendulkar lines were similar, and for, and this is I always find it useful whenever I'm, I'm staring hard at these numbers as to what is this number, what is this poverty line, right? So therefore, just to remind you of some of the basic numbers here, this is for 2011-12 the NSS report, uh, where the national poverty line was rupees 816 per capita per month and 1,000 rupees per capita per month, respectively, for rural and urban areas. Okay? And if you get the roughly two-thirds is one-third rating of rural to urban, it would give you something like uh, uh, overall, uh, you know, an uh, uh, estimate of, uh, sorry, I've done it for the, you know, uh, for, for the 2011 for numbers, something like 1,315. And indeed, where one has to keep in mind though that this is for per capita per month, and if you assume a family of five, this is basically <laughs> 4,000 per month in rural areas and 5,000 per month in urban areas. And for that, the average works out to be 4,000 standard rates. So this is in 2011 12 for a family of five monthly uh, uh, expenditure. Okay. That defines the poverty line. If you're below this, then you're discussed by the school. Just for the sake of comparison, you know, to relate them to contemporary prices, you know, if you use a standard rate of inflation, this would be roughly about 7,000 rupees at current prices uh, for rural areas, 8,500 for urban areas, so about 7,400 overall, right? And if you think about this for a family of five, we don't have to stretch our imagination too much to see that this is a really uh, meager sum. This is not, uh, this is indeed a really conservative line, which is why Ragarajan and others proposed a more uh, relaxed uh, definition for higher standard living for the population. I don't know if this black thing is blocking, is there a way to um, move it around? I don't know. Oh. It is the minimized scrutiny. Like many well intended. Yeah, right. yeah it's fine. So I want to now give a recap of. What essentially is the state of the you know, argument or at least the estimates that we have, and then of course we'll critique it and propose some alternative estimates. So essentially, until 2011, this line gives us the World Bank uh, extreme poverty line measure, what's happening to poverty. So starting with about 60 percent or so, uh, it, you know, just before 1980. It came down to, like I said, about 21.9% in 
in 2011, 12, right? Now, after that, what this uh, dashed uh, vertical line indicates is after that, it's all hypothetical based on scientific estimates. So, therefore, uh, one has to keep it in mind. So, there, essentially, the World Bank study uh, that should be presented by and 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 by Tan, they show this fairly sharp decline, which gets it to about 10 11 percent uh, as of 2017 18. Okay, and you can again, you know, based on how you do the projection, you can project it what it would be now. But because uh, in some ways the earlier analysis should have come around 2017 18, and also the pandemic, which is convenient because after the pandemic, a lot of things that happened. So, therefore, what exactly, what point you choose would uh, influence the results. I think it's, uh, it's not that far back in the, in the past. So, and then Sujit Halla and his co authors, uh, which is the source of the I'm important paper, they do a different method and they come up with the even more uh, optimistic uh, assessment of what happened to poverty in this uh, post uh, 2011 point period. Uh, essentially, it's less than two percent. So it's, it's virtually eliminated. Okay, so that, that is kind of the assessment of, and because they don't win by year, they have this dashed line, and for the uh, World Bank method, they have a more continuous series. Now, essentially, uh, what, uh, you know, the, I will do in the next couple of slides is to, um, is to uh, critique um, these, these uh, studies and, and, and essentially make the case that frankly, these numbers are not ready. Okay? And it's not my opinion, of course. I mean, I will try to show a bunch of uh, you know, um, auxiliary statistics where it passes, whether it passes the smell test or not. Okay? And not just that growth has been going on, etc. So you have to look at other aspects of the economy too. Now, let me first briefly explain what, what's kind of wrong with the Bala and Jal study. Essentially, what they do is they take the 2011-12 distribution of consumption and like I do the long uh, those who have not looked at these uh, uh, so the technicalities, the big idea is like intuitive to just to minimize any confusion. So suppose this is your consumption and this is the distribution of this consumption. Yeah. So what all of these are doing, you choose a poverty line here, and what your headcount ratio. Is basically what percentage of people are in that part. <laughs> that's that's what you do. So what Allah and Allah are doing, yeah, I'm going to be here. They're taking a distribution like that based on 2011. But after that, they do certain extrapolations, which always is not the leap of faith, but in their case, maybe it's been a bit astronomical in terms of the uh, uh, <laughs> So they basically took the national accounting statistics to measure consumption. That's the first step. And again, for those who are not, uh, you know, uh, that familiar with the technicalities here, these are things collected in very different ways. Household expenditure surveys, subject to all the usual problems of these surveys, are essentially you go household to household. Those are in the sample. You collect their, you know, uh, various methods of recall, right? What their consumption has been and why consumption? Because income, especially those whose incomes are uncertain, are harder to have more reliable information on. Whereas consumption is considered to be more fair. Whereas national income statistics is largely driven, uh, you know, there are various methods of doing it, but the primary method of collecting things is factored incomes and essentially value added in various sectors of the economy. And there are kind of indirect methods of backing up the consumption so much. Now, this has a huge amount of uh, sort of, you know, leap of faith to the extent that people going back to the 60s, our Italian past was in a distinguished economist and, and um, a big, uh, sort of, you know, a very deep uh, policymaker in India, they basically said this is not an advisable thing to do because the data sets are so different, you could be, you know, using, uh, I don't know, I mean, some other random indicator, it would be very as noisy that you could do. To apply the national income statistics, you know, to do that. But anyway, what Halaka do is essentially uh, take the consumption growth rate from the national income statistics and apply it mechanically to this distribution and shift it to the right. 
So this involves a second leap of faith. I said, as I said, there are seven leaps of faith. One is whether we use consumption data that we use to do that, whether that is representative or not. And the second is we are also assuming that essentially everybody's consumption do at that same average rate. And indeed, in yesterday's uh, um, um, lecture, as we saw, there is no real evidential basis to make that assumption. If anything, the literature have been going at a faster rate, it's possible uh, because we look at income, but unless you present numbers that everybody's consumption is going at the same rate, this is a huge leap of faith. So, therefore, to be, uh, uh, you know, I would sum up, uh, and I, I try to be as objective as possible. Uh, that study estimates are not taken as very relevant as to the fact that it's still not here in the But the World Bank study, in all fairness, is actually a very well done and careful study. Okay, so basically, what they do, uh, and I think that's a very good approach in general, and the problem is elsewhere with the data that we use, but the approach is. You know, actually quite quite good, and what we do is partly of course influenced by them. Is basically what they do is take this an alternative consumer expenditure data, so which immediately you know takes care of the first problem I mentioned about the earlier. Right? These are consumer expenditure surveys, but this is the CPHS that is published annually by the Center for Monitoring the Indian Economy, which is a private uh, survey uh, organization. And which is quite useful, frankly, I've used it, many others have used it. It's quite a useful uh, survey because, you know, it's just reasonably uh, that thematic way. But there's a problem that I'm coming to. So, what we do is something very, to at least to us, seems a very reasonable thing to do. They basically get the distribution out of this CPHS data set and then using sample re weightings. Try to match it to the NSS in 2011. Okay? Now, it involves several technical steps, which I will not you know, go into the details of, but basically the idea being A, your backward extrapolation. This is not 2014 and that of 2011. And B, uh, the sampling weights, urban, rural, different rules, they are not necessarily the same. But they do, I would say, a reasonable job, uh, and, and they're fairly transparent in doing all kinds of uh, robustness checks and not just present only one set of statistics. So they basically found uh, using uh, this method, they then use the 20, so they create this hypothetical distribution, which is CPHS projected into this NSS, and then use the actual CPHS in 2017-18, and use the same reweighting, and then you have some basis for comparison. Right? You see what happened before. And then they basically find that depending on which estimation method you use, it basically was 9 to 12 percent between 2017 uh, and 2019. Uh, so, roughly speaking, since the proper uh, data around that was available, uh, it has significantly basically gone down by more than half or just about half, which is, you know, which would be a very, very good achievement if it was uh, <laughs> okay. Now, what's the problem with this? Now, the trouble with this is, and this has been a lot of people have written on this, and again, uh, many of us here do surveys, we know all surveys are limitations, so therefore, uh, I would not say that CPHS is doing it for any, any uh, you know, inherent reason to be biased, but that's just the limitation of this survey methodology. Essentially, what the Consumer Expenditure Survey, the NSS, because of course there's theory and history, and of course the early work of our organization, and others followers in setting it up, they basically have a very representative sample as, as representative as it gets. Indeed, it used to be considered a gold standard even internationally, which started you know, before uh, these things were systematically done in developed countries when India was a uh, pioneer uh, for that, uh, for that you know, uh, survey methods uh, and for sample methods. Now, there are several authors such as John Reyes and uh, Anmok Somanchi. Uh, and there's a uh, written extensively on this, essentially shows, and I think quite convincingly, using various technical methods, that basically this survey under samples the data. It's not surprising. It is the consumer pyramid, you know, survey, right? So they clearly, you know, if you want to go to the poor tribal areas in the you know, rural parts, right? Given the survey methodology, which again I will not necessarily the details of, 
that are very credible, which kind of engages as technologists and they are working on trying to improve upon their coverage of that. So basically, what written so much here from that the CPSS falls far short of the national representatives to establish the NSO survey, and in particular, it undercounts the board and it's something over a person richer and more better educated uh, you know, uh, residents, right? So that is really the problem. And the problem is, because of this, whatever repeating you do, you have another distribution which is like, and then you use statistical methods to match it to uh, the NSS one. If the whole left tail, which is this, yeah, is underrepresented, you're kind of drawing on an empty thing, you know, Really not. If, if you have some data there, then this extrapolation would be more informative. So this really is is is, is kind of uh, unfortunate. But that is why uh, there is a uh, bit of a uh, skepticism around it. Okay. And uh, you know, uh, one of the reasons why this skepticism lingers, and hopefully we'll have to add to that over the course of this talk. Uh, some of the work that I've been doing with Richard. So for the reason this says uh, a skepticism even before you know we started looking at these things carefully, you can see in India, you know, all kinds of interesting things happen, right? So the 2017 survey, which was never officially released, was leaked. There's an enterprising journalist called Shonesh Da of Business Standard, who essentially got a copy of this, uh, you know, not the whole survey, not the you know detailed files, but at least the main kind of tables. And he shared it with uh, a group of people, okay? And one of them is the, uh, 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 you know, uh, formidable S. Subramanian retired from uh, MIT and Madras Institute of Development Studies, and, you know, who, who happens to be a family friend. And, you know, you, you don't mess around with uh, uh, Subu, you know, with these numbers. If you throw numbers at him, he's kind of, uh, you know, uh, subjected to very rigorous uh, checks. So essentially, what um, uh, Subramanian did was essentially carry it, you know, presented this distribution for 2017 and calculated all kinds of things, and in particular the poverty numbers. And he essentially represented, he basically showed, and this was the alarming bit forget poverty. In general, the distribution shifted to the left. That is bad news. In general, the distribution do shift to the right. Maybe not equally, maybe not very proportionally, but that's the general tendency to growth and, and, and economic growth that you would expect that. So essentially what we found was there were significant drops in production levels across the distribution. And this was a big deal because perhaps the first drop in many decades, definitely past the rates and how much poverty has been and not, but this was kind of an absolute decrease, right? And there could be many factors for it. And to be fair, it could be the timing of it because of the demonetization rocks in 2014 and 15, the GST rollout, the growth slowdown after 2016. All of these could have played a role in the 2017-18 numbers being particularly bad. So that is possible. It is possible that if one were to do this in 2022-2023, it wouldn't look so bad. But the 2017-18 numbers did not look good. And you know, you can, even though uh, so Romanian presents the uh, Nanadan estimates and his uh, several pieces he wrote on it, he provides enough information for us to back out other estimates too. And in particular, uh, I calculated uh, myself uh, the nuclear uh, poverty line using the leaked thing that Subramanian analyzes. And essentially, it went up from about 22%, which I already reported earlier, to 25% in 2017. Okay, so that's the story. I mean, is it a huge increase? No, but certainly it's not consistent with uh, things kind of uh, getting that. So there's, you know, that it, it, and this I can say in a neutral way, and our skepticism remains in including daily policy service. So everybody acknowledges, even those who are working uh, with the government, that there is enough room for you know, uncertainty as to what's really going on. So, So, what uh, I the for the rest of today's talk, I'm going to present a number of things that I've been working on because ever since I started uh, in um, drawn into this issue, and essentially what we do is a series of smell checks on uh, on on these numbers, whether it's the one ninth, twenty first percent, or for that matter, the Sudramanian very high percent. Right. So essentially, what was really, if you were to do this exercise, 
like what was really the rate of poverty in 2017? That's that's the uh, maybe uh, uh, you know that's the chase that we 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 are doing here. So essentially, what we do is a number of things. Firstly, we look at some economic indicators such as share of agriculture, global output, share of people who are described as the vulnerable employed, those who are self-employed or casual workers with no capital, what their fraction overall is, and try to see is there a decline in these to that would indicate that okay, there is some action coming from here, even though we don't have the consumer expenditure data, but that would be a factor. Okay, so this is one sort of set, set of things that we do. But we also make some international comparisons across comparable countries, etc. That if we look at some of these structural pieces of the economy, such as share of agriculture, and see how India's poverty estimate aligned with those of up to 2011 to us and after, do we see a discontinuity or not? So these are the kind of battery of tests that we can run. And we also look at interstate numbers. Which states had the highest poverty? Which states grew faster during this period? Because suppose Bihar and UP grew relatively faster in this period, or at least was dropped here than that average. Then again, you would have greater confidence that something would be going on. Because see, this is not a big threshold to cross. We saw the number of extreme, you know, I mean, the, the, what those numbers represent. So it is not really superhuman to be able to reduce poverty because it's defined in such a thing that we do. Okay, so we then what we do, and this perhaps is the most constructive aspect of uh, what we do, other than some of the critical uh, uh, things that, uh, that we do, is basically we apply a method which is very similar to what uh, um, Andrew White and, and Sinaroi do, right? Except for we use a different data set, which we argue, and I think that's a fairly convincing argument, is a much more nationally representative. And our contribution is basically the NSS Employment Unemployment Survey, which from 2017 18 has been sort of you know, substituted in the PLF study. And I'll exactly mention how we use this. So, essentially, what we're doing is something similar, but our main claim or our main argument for uh, improvement over what they're trying to do is basically this the sample is more considered to be actually more. So, now I want to think about. How does one kind of conceptually think about what structural aspects of the economy would be correlated with poverty decline? So, right? I mean, we saw growth, we saw inequality, some of the things yesterday. What are the things that would basically uh, reduce poverty? So, how would growth reduce poverty? You know, the basic Lewis model type argument is you're moving surplus labor from traditional low productivity employment, whether from agriculture or from the informal sector into the more formal sectors where there's more value that. And yesterday I showed you some numbers that showed that the per capita earnings in agriculture are much lower than in the other sectors. So therefore either agricultural productivity going up or people moving from agriculture to more ah. value added area would be doing. Okay. So therefore that's how it would be it would be happening. Unconditional growth by itself is not universally poverty reducing unless it is correlated with some of the other changes. Because as I said, if the top 10% is doing very well and the 9% is not stagnating, the growth rates would still look pretty good, right? But it's not necessarily going to really work. So essentially, there's uh, um, you know, um, um, something that um, the existing studies have not looked carefully at, and this is some of the things that uh, you know, we want to do. So I want to first you know, present, has there been significant structural transformation and admittedly it's a decade or even less than a decade so we are not expecting you know uh, to, you know uh, I mean, we have a couple differences but you know are there even some trends towards you know uh, some of these structural things so basically we use two basic measures of structural transformation one is share of agriculture in GDP yesterday I discussed it I showed you some numbers and you know that's really a convincing uh, indicator uh, going back to you know Kuznets and others who have uh, been, uh, uh, documented uh, this sort of broad stylized mass about how economic development is associated with structural transformation. The second and more robust indicator is the structure of the labor market, self employment versus regular salary and employment. Because self employment is always something to be, you know, be something to be very careful about when 
then we, for example, we'll see that when our employment and unemployment statistics is represented, right? Unemployment rate, you will see them. It still doesn't look so alarming. But part of the reason is self-employed are part of the uh, uh, employed. Therefore, they are not technically unemployed. But you could call them the set unemployed. You could you know, call, call them a uh, you know, number of different categories people have come up with. And indeed, there are official survey categories called unpaid family aid. So this is literally, you know, somebody, of course, who is kind of working, that person is not you know, working, but whether this is, you know, consistent with poverty going down is, is something that is not clear. So these are the categories of self-employed workers, right? So the first category is something that one should be really happy about. It's a small business. You know, if you start a business, a shop or whatever, and you employ a few people, that's a legit way that you can say it's a small enterprise, but it will generate some income, some employment. And while one can discuss whether eventually modern sector actually style things should absorb all of them, that's a different matter. But clearly, this will have some economic impact on the standard of living. The self employed workers without employed own account workers are the persons who are kind of basically selling their goods by the books. Okay, and, and many other things. You know, I don't even we can all uh, we are all familiar with some of these categories. And more interestingly and somewhat more uncomfortably, this also includes what in uh, sort of in colloquial language are called the chotuns, the people who are basically around helping and you know, it's like the lift man and the lift man's assistant, or the cab driver and the cab driver's assistant, where the you know marginal product or marginal returns of these guys are questioned. So they're just doing it because they have nothing to do, and maybe this ethic uh, enables them to get an eat or something. Yeah. Now, why is it vulnerable in one? I will you know, I'm, I, I thought just for the sake of uh, rigor, I should you know present a formal definition of the international labor organization. Essentially, some of the examples I gave you captures the thing. There's nothing guaranteed here. What incomes these activities generate are questionable. They may you know, uh, generate some, but and also this combination of low and uncertainty of incomes kind of make them essentially vulnerable employment and not good jobs. If you think about you know, anybody that you know that not necessarily have a formal sector job, but doing well, these are not the kind of jobs that you would consider uh, you know, uh, sort of good jobs to uh, be engaged in. And vulnerable employment also statistically happens to be an excellent predictor of GDP per capita and also turns out to be uh, for, 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 for poverty. And poor countries tend to have 60% or more of vulnerable employment, while it's less than 15% of the workforce um, that is considered vulnerable in interdependent countries. Okay? So essentially, what I'm going to show for the next set of slides with some figures is the structural transformation. Um, uh, you know, uh, statistics doesn't show much promising signs that something like extreme poverty would basically be halved in less than a decade. Okay, and that, that's going to be my first set of, kind of you know exhibits in terms of having uh, some doubts about the bank estimation. So I showed a version of this yesterday, but this is again to just to uh, focus with the current question that we have for today's lecture. So essentially what we have is agriculture, manufacturing, industry, and manufacturing, and services, okay? And the services is the gray one, and the others are all labeled here. What's interesting here is that if you look at around 2010 or so, after that, these curves are not really displaying much of a pattern. You know, we could say services are marginally gone up, and you can see that agriculture has marginally gone down, except for a pump during that pandemic period uh, where, you know, uh, there was actually some people just returned and started investing in that. Yeah. So, just a quick clarification uh, sure. the previous slide. I mean, often the uh, poor households use both consumption and labor as a composite for the household and the Yes, the individuals. Yeah. Okay. So would it still look so bad if it's instead of individuals, the household as a whole uh, produces some amount of labor in the market? No, absolutely so not. It's, it's all it means to see if you look at the poverty numbers that we, we, we you know, that what we define with and look at the poverty line now, which is around 7,000, 7,300 rupees per month for a family of five, right? Now, 
basically what you're saying is these people do <coughs> contribute something that unless you're there kind of, you know, spoiling your business or creating you know being unproductive or uh, you know whatever so they're clearly contributing something and that that does uh, you know uh, help maybe uh, the, the, but the point though is that because they're unpaid right it is very hard to argue that there is significant sort of you know contribution to you know in some ways if it was something the business was needed more labor you would be hiring labor right so this is also true in agriculture when you use family labor so i'm not at all calling it unproductive i'm just calling it is unlikely to be relevant. so when you're including say the person who's an own account worker and this person has his nephew or daughter or son helping him out you know that's unlikely to be you know that other person's income is unlikely to be and if this category is rising you should be suspicious that's 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 all. Otherwise, this is of course adding to the family bond. That's that's true. And yeah, do uh, stop me for any any clarifying questions. And of course, uh, you know, longer uh, questions we can have that uh, given. So here, my only point would be that this curves are kind of flat, right, compared to say the other periods where there was more sharp moves. Say you can see that from 1990 to 2000 to 2010, these movements were more sharp. Here it's really hard to argue that a lot is really positive. This is again employment uh, composition. The previous was just output, so this is employment. And once again, you can see that there is some movement in this period, but these are not hugely you know uh, huge swings and i will split this up more carefully so that we can examine the trends a bit more in detail so indeed there's a, another paper so, so far i've been drawing up you know my work with Risha, but i've also been working on something uh, on specifically on the labor market and that i want to integrate uh, in, in today's lecture uh, which is the work i'm doing with cha and Singh. Uh, 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 Gender and sugar, respectively, where we specifically look at the labor market trends for the last, uh, last three decades. Okay, I'm going to present some numbers from that. So these are very literally fresh from the album, so to speak. Okay, and just to generate the big flow out of the market. So here, what we have is from 1993-94 to remember that this is the NSS employment unemployment survey. So this is the government employment. Uh, Related data. And from 2017 18, it's been subsumed in the periodic labor force service, which is annual. Earlier, it was 2020. So that's where the data is coming from. It's government, you know, official data is the excess. Okay. So what we see here, and if you want to really examine in the period that we're studying, you know, during this period, you can literally say that between 2011 12 and then, you know, uh, around 2017 18 or, you know, a bit later. Uh, there's not really much going on. If you drew a uh, horizontal line, uh, there hasn't really been much change. There's been a dip and then an increase, but it's really not much going on here in terms of employment. Uh, and not just that, sorry, I said it was a bit too fast here. So this is the employed, this is the unemployed, and this is the out of labor force, uh, as, as, and, and this category is the out of labor force. These are people who have withdrawn from the market. They're neither employed nor unemployed, and remember, employed in good self-employed, including family. So these are, you know, that's a different discussion. Uh, gender plays a role here in terms of it's going down, etc. But we can we can come back to that. Uh, and I'd like to focus on uh, what we are doing uh, for today's talk. So this is uh, essentially the unemployment rate, and what we can see that again, starting from 2011-12, if you look at 2017-18. There was a bit of a spike. This is for all ages, right? This is the spike in the unemployment rate, yeah. And the red one is for the youth, the 15 to 30 years of age, and this is for the elder, older workers, right? So clearly there was an upward movement here, and after that there has been a turnaround, right? And in the, in this paper we are trying to examine is this upward movement, or put differently, uh, the downward movement in unemployment. And I think it's the good news. And you know, that's a separate discussion. And we argue that it's largely driven by the you know rise of the unpaid family work academy. So therefore, there's not that much to rejoice here. But anyway, but the point though is that nothing is observable here that would be consistent with uh, you know uh, the bottom 50 percent standard of living, yeah, making maybe you know, improving. 
This is again, uh, you know, something which I find very interesting to look at. So here we are just looking at the category of uh, the various employed. Okay, and essentially you have the salaried here, the orange one. The casual workers are here, and the self-employed, which includes all these categories: small businesses, employing people, own and farm workers, and family help in those uh, own and farm businesses. They are all lumped together. So once again, you can see not much is happening, you know, between 2011, 12, and 2017, 18, except for here there's been a dip in casual workers' price in the in the in the in the, in the salary, but after that, of course, it's been fairly flat. This last one essentially shows that between, you know, this is now opening up the employer, one account worker, and unpaid family worker. So this is unpacking the self employment category. So we are going sequentially, right? So earlier we saw those with salary jobs, the best, you know, category to be in, the casual workers who are working in exchange of wage, and then the self employment, right? Now we are unpacking uh, the self employment category. So as you can see, the entire category is fairly fine school and fairly flat. And it's not just in the recent era. That's been kind of generally been flat since the early 90s. Okay, so not a lot is happening. India, land of a billion entrepreneurs kind of things, you know, are fine in the Western press, uh, et cetera, but that's not quite consistent with what we see, right? What's interesting is you can see that from 2011 to other, there's been a rise in own account workers, right? This is this is that trend from 2011 to 12, you know, there's been a rise and that stayed flat. And initially there was a decline in the unpaid uh, family workers up to this point. After that, there has been a slow increase in the fraction of unpaid family workers in this category. So this is basically unpacking uh, this uh, 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 certain amount category. This is my final graph from the set of things that I'm doing with the same, which is basically looking at the earnings, average earnings. Okay, and this number is only available from 2017-18 because the PLF has collected and the earlier we do not have comparable numbers for everything. So therefore it starts from 2017-18. And you can see that my main points here to show is that, of course, as we would expect, the average earnings of the salaried group is significantly higher than that of the other groups. The one of the casual workers are the lowest. Uh, presumably, if you have the luxury or option of working as an unpaid family workers, you still it's better than you know going out and trying to uh, 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 work, work work against the wage. But the point to do is that they're significantly lower, and in particular 2017, 18 onwards, and so on, there's not much of a trend going on in the earnings and also for the salary workers. And like I said, you know, one of the quips I made yesterday, you know, in the end, it's wages, you know, I mean, businesses can complain about rising wages as a problem, but it's really rising wages and rising employment that is how economic growth or economic development shows that the most steps are taken. That's how that's how it really happens. Also, this is a graph I showed yesterday, so you can for, for now ignore the dash one, which was to do with the other nourish. But this is basically the precarious employment category that the ILO collects. And once again, we are showing it from 2005 to uh, uh, just before 2020. And you can see that that category has not changed much. Okay. So essentially, to sum this up, the share of agriculture uh, output has been stagnant for nearly two decades at 16 to 17% of the GDP. In addition, we find precarious forms of employment growth have remained stubbornly high for an economy that has otherwise grown at a fairly impressive uh, rate since the 90s. So uh, not a lot is happening here that would give us the confidence that essentially poverty overall basically was halved. In the, in, the, in, the, in the last decade, that's sort of the main thing. So now we will basically come to some of our more, uh, so this was more like raising the doubts in you know whether these uh, existing estimates are onto something, and we are fighting over a few percentage points here or there. That's you know, one good debate to have, and I prefer to have that debate. So this is questioning, are the numbers really even passing the smell test, or do we have to sort of you know, move back to the uh, drawing board and try to do this again. 
So one of the things, the first thing I want to show you is on a cross-country basis, uh, what is the relationship between share of agriculture as a percentage of GDP and poverty, and where does India line up here? Okay. So essentially what we will see in the next graph is this is the graph. It's a little bit of a non-obvious graph to read, so let me spell it out a bit more. So essentially what we have are there are four countries representing, you know, uh, the black one is uh, the India, China, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. Uh, so if you have a question, you could ask. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> uh, in terms of uh, poverty, we have more subsidized productions. BDS. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, I'll do it. So I'm glad you raised the question. If you read the Bhalaital's paper, they do the estimates with PDS without PDS makes some margin difference. So that unfortunately does not, uh, you know, it's not like something is not being done. And, and there's a growth of MSMEs. Uh, that is a growth rates. Mm -hmm. That has that may be true, but something that has to show up in the aggregate employment statistics. MSMEs can grow. Fair enough, but these are the PLFS and NSS employment and employment statistics. So that may have grown, but we saw overall what's happening to uh, the uh, businesses, right? I mean, this is the fraction of those we would be employees. I doubt if, uh, you know, one account worker would feel grand enough to call himself uh, MSME. So presumably it would be from this category. So not much is happening. Yeah. You can see, let me give you the, you're trying to look at a population of 1.4 billion. So something would be rising very fast. You know, the stock market is not going badly. Certain sectors are not going badly, right? Question is, what's the multiplier effect on that is spreading around? So otherwise, you have to pay by. And you know, I haven't looked at the MSME data specifically, but surely there has been sectors and there has been some growth. Clearly, that that has been the case. But the question is, is it moving the aggregate curves enough? Because otherwise, the you know, this jokey way that test we are giving today is the poverty thing. It's not about whether anything is happening in the economy or not, right? Of course, cross data checks are important. So one of the things that this would imply is what is the important elasticity of the NSME growth? That's a good question. I know I don't think. And let me, if I come back to this, so let me explain the graph a little bit. So essentially what we have is for the period of, I'm sorry, um, for the period of 1980 to 2021, what we did was essentially plotted the agriculture as a percentage of GDP and the headcount of poverty. Okay, that's what we are plotting. So let's look at any individual country. The blue one seems the brightest color. So let's look at the blue one, that's there now. Right? So presumably this is going backwards in time. That's why I, I personally find this graph a bit confusing. But it is what it is. It's basically plotting points that gives you the share of agriculture as a you know, fraction of GDP. And what is the corresponding headcount ratio? And it's just plotting it over time, right? So you can see for Vietnam, this been a kind of negative, you know, relationship as one would expect. Same the case with Bangladesh, the green curve. Same the case with China. With India, there's a vertical fall. So poverty, if you take the World Bank estimates, right, it has gone down to as low as 10%, but without a concomitant, you know, a change in the share of agriculture. So this is again uh, something that should make us a uh, little bit uh, doubtful. This is a related but more rigorous test. So suppose, uh, and I, I because this is a, a, a general audience and not just uh, economists, so I'll try to explain this in a, in a more, more, more uh, 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 in a lucid way uh, or simple way than that uh, otherwise. So suppose. We basically run a statistical kind of relationship between headcount ratio of poverty and agriculture as a share of output as well as vulnerable environment. Clearly, it will not explain everything. Like all statistical equations, it will estimate part of this equation, right? But it would give us a certain relationship from these different countries and over time as to what is happening when agriculture share goes down, what's happening when, when the vulnerable environment is showing up. And we can use that estimate to check whether India's data points are largely along this regression line or are they kind of going up. 
Because if they're going off once again, one would have reasons to suspect that something is with the head down ratio that that is not. And that is indeed the case. So if you look at this sort of line, that is captures the relationship estimated over many countries, everything in the World Bank, the uh, uh, poverty equality platform, EIP database that one will I mean, download and run these things. So if you look at until about the 2009 run, it's kind of bang on the line. So whatever this you know, regression is predicting for, you know, it's estimated out of many countries, India is kind of, you know, on that line. So it's kind of following that. In 2011-12, it is going a bit off. So essentially, uh, the, you know, uh, the uh, relationship between uh, actual poverty uh, headcount versus what this line would estimate, yeah? And essentially, what this, uh, you know, this, this two numbers I put in here, 2017, 2018, is where it's going off the line. The actual poverty rate is lower than what this line would have predicted if you put in the specific values of the share of agriculture or consumption. So something, you know, uh, is going off the line. So therefore, there are all these reasons that I would say that should create a reasonable uh, sort of case that we should be taking this significant decrease in poverty with skepticism. It may have gone down, it may have gone up marginally, it may have stayed the same, but halving over less than a decade is something that what the World Bank kind of estimates, official estimates kind of, uh, you know, do, uh, should give us some respect. I want to now look at the within India perspective. So this was taking other countries and trying to see where India fits in into the structural contribution parameters. But if you look at um, now uh, some state-specific data, what we have plotted in this graph is basically per capita income growth uh, over 2011 to 2019 on the horizontal axis and the poverty headcount ratio. So these are state-specific numbers. Okay. And what we basically see is where per capita income actually is higher, the poverty income ratio is lower. It's nothing surprising. That's what you would expect. And you can see that you know there are obviously you know uh, some countries where simply poverty is more than what that per capita income would sort of indicate. So, for example, if we do a vertical line here, these are all comparable levels of per capita income growth. Yeah. But West Bengal seems to have done marginally better in this. It's slightly below this line. And Sepulchre uh, and Hartman have seems to have done worse given this corresponding vote. Yeah. So that's kind of exhibit uh, one. This is when we look at the cost state. The states with the highest poverty headcounts are also the most populous, but their growth rates typically lag the richest states. And if you think about it, the analogy with what I showed yesterday should become very clear. There we show that the top end of groups are going to the faster rate. Here we are showing well, where do the top income group people live? They presumably live in richer states or you know, cities and, and, and so on. And that's where, you know, therefore, uh, in some of their group has been more. And you know, this is not therefore looking very promising. Only a bit, very few states experience income in India's kind of you know five to six percent per capita growth rates. And here, what we do is essentially look at, is there any pattern of convergence? So if you look at, say, richer states and poorer states, is there a chance that the poorer states have a huge advantage? You know, many disadvantages, mostly disadvantages. The huge advantage is if they're starting with a low bar. So a 10% improvement, right? And it's a classic thing. If you earn 30 out of 100 in an exam, for you, a 10% increase is no bar to cross, but somebody has gotten 80 out of 100, it is a 10%, it's a higher bar to cross. So, therefore, there's almost a statistical reason why you would expect that even little improvements in the poorer states would show up in greater percentage changes. Unfortunately, if you look at this figure again, I wish the, you know, the state names were a bit more uh, clear. I, I can see that they're not that easy to read, so we'll try to do better. Uh, the next time uh, uh, we, we uh, get back at it. But basically, what we see here is it's the richest states essentially that have experienced the higher growth. You know, Bihar, and if you compare Bihar and uh, Delhi, you know, that's about 12% of its per capita income, Bihar's. And that has not really changed between 2011, 12, and 2021. 
essentially the gap between the richest and the poorest states of India is equal to the gap between the high income countries and low income countries. Okay, so if a lot of action is happening where the poor live, these are not the kind of graphs you would expect. Yeah, or at least the picture would be more mixed. Yeah. So what is really happening to poverty? And I'm now going to come to the final part of, uh, of what, I, what I have to say and then conclude with some general uh, thoughts, uh, which is essentially we now take a more constructive other than, you know, like in the courtroom dramas or whatever, raising enough sort of reasonable doubt as to whether you know, poverty has indeed, you know, after all of this, let's try to do a constructive approach and estimate it using methods which our would be synthetic measure too, and then we'll be subject to similar criticism as to you know, we are really combining two data sets, right? Just think about this. Suppose you want to compare the exam performance of two schools. One school did not publish the report in 2017. So you're basically trying to match the you know, school basis data for both years. Somehow compare the distributions. I think 2011 12, they were different, but suppose we are reparameterized. Therefore, I kind of match what was happening there. So I, then I would be able to use the other side <coughs> of the data to project what is the hypothetical distribution of marks for the school that did not publish the data. Inherent in this is, of course, several leaves of faith. So therefore, you know, if I were to uh, bet money on this estimate, I would actually bet money uh, because it also lines up with some other things too. So that it's also true. If I'm very honest, the answer is we don't know. These are all hypothetical exercises. And all we can have is more confidence in which something is more representative. As I already said, one of the things I like about the World Bank working paper is they've actually been very rigorous in trying to doing various kinds of variation. Because otherwise, if we just present one set of results, we immediately think, suppose we made this, what would happen? So, you know, the uh, last time I read the paper, it is a good paper which uh, proposes a nice thing. Okay. So, and as I said, the problem is in our view, we are using the CPHs. Um, so, um, we want to basically use the NSS uh, Employment and Employment Survey and the PLFS as this alternative to the CPHs and do this indirect kind of you know, estimation of what would have been the NSS distribution uh, in 2017 18, yeah, using this. So, basically, what it has is these are nationally representative survey based on the labor market, but this also samples households and details every household member, whether working, underage, or retired. Also has a measure of consumption, but it's not detailed enough to be directly comparable with the original NSS one. Because that, in a way, would then end the need to do all of this, but then not really directly comparable, right? So essentially, we are using this data set because of this representativeness. So we construct a new measure of consumption, which is different from one that the, uh, you know, uh, NS, uh, the, uh, it's the employment unemployment service would be. And basically, we think that this is a better measure of consumption than the ones that they uh, represent. Essentially, what we do is, because we have detailed kind of wage data starting from 17, 18, and, and these planning stages, right? So basically, we can use these wages and try to mask them to the consumption in 2011-12, estimate that relationship, and from that project it in 2017-18 and create the you know, uh, distribution of consumption. So once again, you know, there are technicalities involved, but the core logic is simple. So I'm saying that your wages explain a fair bit of the consumption of the statement one. Yeah? We have detailed wage data. Let's therefore generate a consumption out of this wage and try to match it to 21, 11, 12, because there we actually have the NSS and you mentioned this data. And then we look at the weights that allows us to match it reasonably, okay? Then we say, okay, we are gonna use the same weights and then do it for 2017, 18, create this hypothetical distribution of the data, and from then plot out the positive. Again, nothing that we're doing here is, you know, fundamentally different from what that why in the royal they did. We're just using uh, two things that are a bit different. So one, six, seven, uh, one is using this wage to compute the consumption simply because this consumption numbers are not so reliable. And the fact that it's a uh, uh, you know representative you know uh, sample. Yeah, please. 
Yeah, if you have detailed wage data, mm -hmm. then uh, what prevents you from get an estimate of the growth of the real wages of the bottom uh, 20 30 percent? Of you know, you don't have to go to the production because essentially the poverty would come to the pocket, the income of the poor. So if you get that, two reasons, reasons we don't do that. Fair question. Two reasons we don't do that. Was one is John Dress and others have written, you know, by the way on this. So they are working on that, that particular, you know, uh, you know, thing has been studied. But we, so uh, that we are almost like, you know, uh, you could say it's a bit of a chaotic chase here. We want to match the 2011 12 poverty numbers. That's what we are trying to do. Therefore, you know, wage growth, everything, you know, that's all good. But we actually, that's our chase. We want to essentially, you know, see something that's comparable. But otherwise, I agree that that would be uh, <laughs> uh, uh, interesting and important thing to look at. And indeed, I have some numbers which I don't have here, but with the paper that I'm doing with Jhar and, and Singh, we have some of those numbers, not exactly what you're asking for, but we do have over a span of the earnings growth by percentile, uh, sorry, by this side and so on. So we have, uh, yeah. I was just going to say that if it was my computer, I could back it up, but I think it would be possible. So essentially, uh, let me let me uh, 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 you know this uh, to pass. So essentially, uh, uh, what what we you know essentially had already said verbally. So therefore, uh, this is a little bit of you know why you know, our approach is you know a, an improvement over what we have so far. That we are capturing the growth and living standards wages without the NAS implications, which has its critiques. And also allowing for distribution across states and within sectors. Because with data sets of uh, ELFS and uh, employment unemployment survey as detailed, you can allow for regional variations, etc., with new regional analysis tasks. And also, we are not using this you know, private data set. So, our model captures this binomial consumption distribution you know, in 2011 12. So, based on what we estimate, Essentially, uh, what we have is the thick line is the actual NSS 2011-12 distribution. It's what I was trying to uh, draw here informally. And this dash line is what is predicted out of you know, this exercise. And this gives us reasonable confidence that they are uh, kind of a good fit. You know, they're not an exact fit, but they're a reasonably good fit. So therefore, we are going to then put in different numbers into this machine, and we'll spit out a distribution for 2017-18 that was just with a dash because we don't have the actual. Okay, now the headline findings. Uh, essentially, this. So essentially, what we find is if you look at either you know, uh, so we have written 2018, but it's really 2017-18, and this is 2019, but that's really 2018-19. Essentially, what we have is that, you know, the rural poverty, this is rural poverty, this is urban poverty, and this, you know, is rural and urban. So you can see that in 2019, which has gone down a bit, okay? But their overall average, which I'll report in a second, is uh, uh, calculated in the uh, bottom, uh, sorry, the top left of this thing, that in a way is our headline finding. So I thought it was the previous one, but this actually aggregates it from rural and urban. So it gives you the aggregate numbers. So based on our estimate, we do two sets of exercises. One, we scale this artificial distribution to the leak tables. Because the leak tables, if you were to take them, you know, then they actually give you that equivalent of the thick line for 2017. But you should also be acknowledging that perhaps you know that was a barrier, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we should also do it without kind of this way. And again, to the non-economist or non-non statistician, this might all sound a bit convoluted. It's literally what weights you put on different things. You know, if, if you believe more people now live in urban areas than rural areas, that's something that we believe it hasn't really changed that much from the last census, that's something else. So you're doing variations. Uh, this is what is really called scaling, uh, you know, and of course it, it's more involved. So if no scaling is applied, yeah, then basically what we have in 2017, the year when the NSS leak report was published, and we do actually, based on this estimate, do find that what Supramanian reported and the NSS uh, actually reported, this is lower than this. So this is about 20%, but it's a far cry 
from the 10.8% that the World Bank is, you know, they have various ranges from 9 to 12, but their preferred estimate is something like 10.8. It is far higher than that. And for 2018-19, it has gone down a bit, but it's still about 17%. So these are, you know, I would say, again, it's not showing that poverty has shot up compared to 2011-12, right? But these are numbers that leave us not that much ground for optimism or a very significant increase in poverty. And if you scale it to the league tables, it you know goes up a bit. Actually, not a bit, it actually goes up a fair bit. And that therefore, if you're skeptical, if that's not a you know mixture you want to drink uh, for whatever reason, then you can take the unscaled one. And subsequent to uh, what you know, this pre preparing for this presentation, we have used some other methods also, which essentially uses the uh, uh, as this uh, underground and non survey consumption data, but not directly. And it does a similar exercise that we did with the wages, but does that with that, and it goes up only marginally. So compared to the 19.6, it goes up to something like 21.8%. Yeah. So then, of course, in this table, this might be a little uh, cluttered or maybe even small font to look at. Essentially, what we have is a comparison between these various studies. If you can look at post state 2017 18, you know, if you look at the Halalaika study, that's 7.1% based on one particular method that they use, and subsequently it goes down. This is the basis for their claim that India has eliminated a nearly of the human exchange poverty. Whereas the lead World Bank report presents something like 13.4%, uh, and our numbers are basically, you know, uh, uh, this, this number, uh, you know, the scale one, and, and essentially. It's also based on the different default methods that those who study power statistics would know. And what's interesting is we have also plucked out what the estimate of poverty should have been based on those regressions that we did based on the cross country comparison of structural um, uh, you know, pieces of the economy, such as shared value, et cetera. So if you pluck the numbers out from that, that would give us a range of 22 to 28 percent. Whereas these numbers are kind of on the lower end of that, but that's what we are getting, and that's what gives us some confidence that they are not entirely problem. <clears throat> so I want to kind of now sum up, and this is a better visual summary than a table. Essentially, uh, our estimate, in a way, as, uh, you know, explains better the features of the structural change in India uh, over since 2011. So let's just uh, you know look at this graph. So this is basically the green thing is the share of agriculture as a percentage of GDP, and this is simply uh, 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 you know, uh, the 80s and before. So we can just look at this part of this where we you know like to point out that this will be getting flat, right? This is the number of the World Bank that I have you know uh, uh, you know I reported earlier the synthetic estimate that they showed, right? And this is the number that we are essentially you know. Uh, you know, our, our revised estimate, this dashed line, is what we are pointing out. And the red curve is the government. Once again, this is kind of showing a bad line there. Okay, so therefore, if you ask me what would be my preferred number out of these various estimates given, it would be something like this. You know, one fifth of the population, which is slightly below the 22% number using the you know, method, and that's kind of now, one of the things that we are kind of, you know, I, I, I get to, uh, you know, somebody who, who is not studying these things carefully it might seem a bit uh, of a uh, kind of narrow and technical things to chase. But look, this has huge implications for a lot of headlines you read on a daily basis. So, whenever the World Bank says global poverty has gone up or down by this, what's happening to India? These percentage points were hanging over. Yeah? That has a huge impact because when 1% of Indian population exits extreme poverty, the corresponding reduction in the global poverty headcount would be about 20 to 20, you know, whatever, 0.20 to 0 point. So you can multiply by 10. So if there's a 10%, you know, of Indians who exit poverty, it would be basically pushed down those numbers by two to three percent. Okay, so therefore, you know, this is this is this is kind of a big deal. So therefore, to the extent that we are hoping we have been talking with the World Bank, you know, poverty unit. Or again, all, all very serious, and you know, of course, we, we, you know, we will uh, get their feedback on what we are doing, etc. So we are hoping that you know, at least uh, this will be taken into account, and they can run the similar method using PLFs themselves and come up with uh, hopefully different estimates. 
There's also a general discussions. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of wrapping up, so I'm very, very keen, of course, to have a more general discussion uh, about what all this implies. But there are often this multi-dimensional policy index numbers that often come up, and the government seems more forthcoming and enthusiastic in releasing them. But there are many problems uh, with those, even though it's not like you know, they're useful. But I always, you know, my general intuitive feel for them is look, there are many ways of checking something we have. And therefore, once you mention poverty, the populists have metrics that are useful to know. And if there are movements there, that way. But if you're looking at basic, say, body mass index, then those things are not really going to be a uh, you know, perfect predictor of that. So, therefore, if you want to really you know, ask the question that what is the average consumption of the poor, then whether they have access to water, whether they have access to electricity, all those are good things. And in some qualitative metric, if you have comparable numbers, we should look at the whole, whole picture, right? And I actually do believe that there's been some improvements in some of those access variables over the last uh, seven to eight years. It has actually happened, right? But the question is, is the economic engine, you know, working or pulling the very core up from the, you know, levels of consumer expenditure? And that's where we have our genuine doubts. Indeed, you know, I was chatting with, uh, it's not, Yesterday as well, Sid Martin the Valley. And you know, there are many critiques of these multi-dimensional poverty indices, and therefore they're always useful to keep in mind uh, in when they're doing it. Essentially, uh, they're not comparable with monetary measures of poverty, and they also have inherent limitations that once in an urban area, even in a slum, everybody has electricity, you will see poverty to be eliminated in that dimension. There will be no further improvement, right? So therefore, there are some inherent limitations there. But not to say they're not useful. But interestingly, if you look at the uh, uh, multi-dimensional poverty range nationally uh, during this period, uh, they are in the 17 to 27 percent uh, range. But keep in mind, though, these percentages is like comparing the math exam score with the favorite writing metric, you know, score. So they're not exactly comparable. Yeah. So that's that's something I want to. Know. So I now want to. Yeah, I don't think I said what I'm all right in terms of time. Um, so keep in mind that this you know, extreme poverty line is very conservative. So here we're literally asking that have people gotten pass marks or not. So it's not a question of you know college or education students are doing great. We're really asking something very, very conservative. And the fact that if our estimates are convincing, if one out of five Indians live in extreme poverty, where our GDP is fifth in the world, we have many in the in the very, very rich list and all of that. Even if you were to take a neutral view on those, that, that's fine. You know, let 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 the you know hundred flowers bloom and let, let, let all kinds of things happen. That's okay. So this is something to uh, keep in mind that what's happening to the bottom part of the distribution. I think the general take I would take out of these two lectures, and this is something I genuinely passionately believe in. I know that there's this literature on uh, deep growth. So this is basically people who are saying that due to environmental reasons and so on, we should get out of the growth obsession. That's a different discussion to have, and I'm happy to engage with that in a QA. But I think that we should have a deep growth from using growth as an indicator whatsoever. I genuinely think per capita income is fine, even GDP is fine, but growth rates, you know, we should look at them, but fundamentally they capture very little. And even just again to go back to my you know sort of lighthearted example, if a child comes and say that I have you know gotten a 20 percent improvement in my marks, you know you would have to look at you know how exactly or you know remember how exactly what the marks were. So my growth rate is pretty good, right? I'm one of the top in the world. You know that's something that I think the business press does it, policy makers does it, and often this becomes just conventions. Whatever I'm saying on this point would not be genuinely disputed by anybody who, you know, I mean, even whether they're from the right of the policy, policy spectrum or the left. This is just a very deep, you know, basic point that we should come out of this, you know, focus on growth. Still, for capitalism, yes, they contain information, and of course, poverty and other things, and also. We saw that in the course of these two lectures, growth is important, and therefore nobody is harking for an era that you don't have much growth and you know everybody is not you know, in terms of stagnant. There's nothing really to celebrate there. 
But fundamentally, though, unless it you know uh, spreads over a large parts of the population, it's a bit like if a rich person buys a private jet, good for him and his family. Uh, where you know what is it there for the rest of the uh, uh, us to rejoice with? It, unless that that's really spreads across the distribution. And also keep in mind that in all of this, maybe the earlier regimes, starting with the uh, uh, liberalization and uh, advancing and so on. They benefited from initially the base was low, so reducing poverty was a bit easier, right? Because you had lots of you know uh, poor people, some growth was happening. Now, as Bogdanu has pointed out, that as you progress through the economic ladder, it becomes harder and harder to do. So there's a form of diminishing returns in terms of how how easy it is to touch poverty by another five percentage points or ten percent. So that's something to keep in mind. And that's once again why this last decade official numbers or the synthetic numbers that others have produced leave us with some uh, amount of skills. Now, essentially, like I said yesterday, and this is really an overall summer, the fact that growth has not translated in significant decline in poverty or structural transformation over the last decade is a matter of concern, not just if you are particularly concerned about equity, but also the sustainability of the growth path. Will the engine even continue? That if otherwise, if you just keep on going, then maybe it's good for a small segment and that's good. But for reasons we argued <coughs> yesterday, there are reasons to believe that this kind of uh, non inclusive growth or exclusive growth path would be inherently limited in how long it can be sustained, especially for a large country. If you're a small economy, uh, you know, maybe it is possible, but it's just harder to do there. And therefore, I would say the you know, main thing that I'm sorry, I, this is more technical stuff if the questions come up. Then I think that A, we should do degrowth better as opposed to degrowth, right? And the second thing is that we should also do, you know, to the extent we report growth, we should do it for all the different parts of the income distribution because that is very meaningful. Because just to again give you maybe a, a sort of post analogy. The CEO's income of a company has gone up by 50% or you know, 10 times, you know. Okay, unless I know what's happening to the workers, you know, you can see that you can carry that analogy and apply to the economy. So if you, a certain segment is doing very well, all good. But the question is, you know, the total numbers, we can see what's happening to the rest. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you.